to the next episode of Conversations with the Future. My name is Oscar Johnson and I'm Academic Director at the Center for the Governance of Change. We're an applied research center uh, researching emerging technologies and how they impact the world and how to govern them. One of the things we're thinking about is um, the future of higher education, which is the topic of today's episode. Education is one of the most important tools for improving society, changing individual destinies for social mobility and ensuring tomorrow's wealth by innovation. However, today um, the world is changing at breakneck speed. So we want to ask ourselves, how's universities handling this change? Are they keeping up? What should we be doing? Today we're joined by two people who have not only been researching this, but also put their money where their mouth at, so to speak, and created their own companies and programs in order to improve it, education. Both of them are also member of the advisory board from our project on the future of higher education that will be presented early next year. We have first Dr. Victoria Galamuro, who is co-founder and CEO of Innovative Futures Institute, a think and do tank that advises and supports universities, business, governments, and innovation efforts. She has worked with the European Commission, the OECD, with governments, universities. We also have Dr. Jason Blackstock, who is CEO and founder of How to Change the World, uh, a program and ex experiential education program to solve our technical, economic, and social questions. Jason was also the founding head of UCL, Science, Technology, Economics, and Public Policy Department between 2013 and 2018, which he's still involved with. Um, and I want to ask the first question to you, Jason. First, you created this department in UCL, and now you're CEO of, of How to Change the World. Where does, this come, where does this come from? What, what wasn't working? What were you trying to fix? Oscar, thank you very much. Um, it's a great question. Um, and uh, let me start by saying modern universities are doing some absolutely phenomenal things. We only have to look at some of the contributions they've been making to, for example, COVID and, and the, the societal response to COVID from designing new PPE and ventilators through to vaccines. They're making great contributions. But I think we have to remember that the modern university was designed predominantly as a research institution. And that dates back to the history of the university from the 12th to, to 19th centuries when they were predominantly just research institutions with a very small number of individuals. And the success they had during the world wars in contributing to the knowledge generation help with the war, it led to the modern university being launched in 1950 when uh, that really was focused on research to solve technical challenges. And it's done a brilliant job at that. But we call them higher education institutions, but at their heart, they really are higher research institutions. And I, I, I wanted to lay that as the foundation, along with one important statistic. In 1950, when the foundations for the modern research universities are being laid, less than 10% of European and North American populations went to university. Unsurprisingly, today, more than 80%, 60 to 80%, depending on which country you're talking about across Europe and North America, are going into higher education degrees. The model that was set up in the 1950s around research doesn't necessarily scale to deliver education to that level. So you ask the question, uh, what was not working? Why did I do an educational spin out? Well, two reasons. One, setting up a new department in a university is a rare opportunity, and I was really blessed to be able to do that in, in a university like UCL. And we pushed the boundaries as far as we could, and we've done some really innovative stuff in, in UCL Steve to create different models of education. But uh, as I know we'll talk about here, the rate of change of the, the needs of society in terms of modern education, in terms of mo not modern knowledge uh, uh, and skills development, is just outpacing the ability of large institutions like that to keep up. Um, and so, and, uh, so I spun out how to change the world. We developed the program at UCL and delivered it there, but we spun it out into, uh, into a social enterprise to be able to deliver it even more widely because UCL as an institution isn't equipped to set up educational programs that help other universities develop their curriculum. Aren't, it's not set up to uh, run uh, professional development programs inside large organizations that need the same skills development that undergrads are getting today. And so the diversification of how we deliver education is unlikely to be done just by large institutions. We need to have a more creative ecosystem. And that's part of the reason we need social enterprises as well as modern universities. Thank you very much for that, Jason. And I see you nodding, Victoria. I, I mean, I want to ask a very similar question. Well, you know, 
was this also what you were looking at and thinking of, of higher education being higher research institutions? Is that why you set up innovative, um, innovative futures, in, innovative futures institute? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Oscar. It's a pleasure for me to be here and just uh, also having a conversation, not just with you, but also with uh, with Jason. Uh, for me, the I completely agree. Uh, with uh, with all these statements that uh, Jason has made, and and for me it was slightly different, because after working in academia and in industry and also uh, in government multilateral organisations and seeing how disconnected disconnected they were, and also doing a PhD on university industry collaboration to understand this topic really deeply, I decided that my place was right there, right in the interface in the middle of all of them because i mean currently from uh, in innovative futures institute we are supporting high education institution business and government but to innovate but to do it collaboratively because i i do firmly believe that the future is collaborative that uh, innovation is at the edges of disciplines and sectors and people and also problem is that there, I have the feeling that there are not enough people that are efficient connectors of all these stakeholders. And uh, I saw some basic problems in, in these relationships and why they do not cooperate, starting by the initial lack of awareness, because exactly because they, these organizations have little tradition and, and of culture of collaboration then uh, they were not aware of what each other needs or have to offer. And then if they manage to overcome that and come in contact with each other and start in this sort of a relationship, then they also realize that they come to it with different motivations, different expectations, different timeframes. And that really, um, we could say that the relationship with you, between universities and business often do not work naturally mm. uh, because of these things. So that's why um, boundary spanning professionals and these people that know of both worlds and understand and, and know how to facilitate these connections are really important. And, um, and that's what we're doing. Mm. No, I think, that, I think that sounds good. And I'm, I, I'm, I wanted to try to ask, you know, how, how urgent do we need to do this rethink of, of the way we're doing things? I'm thinking of, you know, the seminal study by, by Carl Frey and, and Michael Osborne in 2015 or something saying that, you know, 47% of jobs are in high risk of, uh, of automation within 10 years period. And, you know, from my own experience of the, the, you know, the higher education sector is not the one that transforms that quickly. Uh, so my question is really in a way is, is societal change um, running so much faster than universities and are adapting and in that case you know how can we and especially to the labor market i mean how can we keep up with with what is needed tomorrow uh let me uh let me just answer that with a, a resounding i don't think the universities are going to keep up i don't think they can um, and I think we're going to see, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a lot of creative destruction in the next two decades. I think it's an essential part of uh, revitalizing the way we think about knowledge management, skills uh, development um, uh, in the 21st century. I think we're, we're facing, um, uh, we're all very familiar with the, uh, the concept of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that while there are, there are limits to that idea, I think it is a powerful one. And if we think back in response to the previous industrial revolutions, I would argue one of the, uh, the most important public policy decisions that was made in response to uh, uh, the first, second uh, uh, industrial revolutions was the creation of universal primary and secondary education, K to 12. You couldn't have a literate, numerate, engaged citizenry without that in the modern world that was created then. Um, but today, in order to respond to, uh, to the impacts of the third and fourth industrial revolution, I think we need that scale of rethink and rewrite of what higher and lifelong education means. And if you were to start with a blank sheet of paper today 
and, and design a, a higher and lifelong education system the same way they designed K-12 to back in the, the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s, you wouldn't really design the modern university and the modern college systems. You'd design something that had a lot more uh, diversification within it. I think one of the things that, that it, that's worth talking about is um, uh, universities are, are not the only part of the higher education and lifelong uh, learning system. Colleges, institutes, um, uh, uh, technical vocational education has to be a piece of that. But it all has to integrate more with these concepts of the academic virtues of curiosity, of, uh, of freedom of, of, of exploration and expression, which frankly need to be virtues of the modern citizenry, not just academia anymore. But that means there's a blurring of the line that doesn't hold academia as this hallowed hall up on the hill, but rather a concept of how do we spread those types of virtues throughout society and diversify. I couldn't agree more with Victoria that we, we have had a tendency to treat academia over here, industry over here, public policy over there, and with very big disconnects between those, those communities within society. We, if, if we were to redesign with a whiteboard what the higher education, lifelong learning knowledge system looked like, you, you design a much more interconnected system than we have today. And I think that's part of the reason that we're seeing innovation at the boundaries to try and break those down. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of it driven by the fact that large institutions who don't change their incentive structures fast enough are never going to keep up with the rate of change we're seeing. And you're going to see a lot more uh, creative destruction coming in from, uh, from innovative organizations on, on the edges. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good segue to, to you, Victoria, I mean, um, who are trying to, to build a little bit of this from, from bottom up. I'm happy to get your perspectives. Definitely. So Jason was started saying they are going to be unable to keep up. I'd like to keep some hope. So let me tell you, I do believe it's going to be extremely difficult for them to keep up, but I would like to just just give or, or, or leave uh, a bit of a light to say that if they react quick and reactively enough, it has to be like that, otherwise the small changes are, are not good anymore, then they might be able to still play a role in the future society. I, I like to believe that. And, uh, but for that, for that really lots of things need to change. Probably the first one is the belief, or I would say firstly, they need to believe that universities do not have the monopoly of knowledge anymore. Knowledge is everywhere and we have academic knowledge and we have practical knowledge and it's all valid and it's all valuable. And, and universities need to be humble enough to recognize that and as a consequence to open up, to open up with collaborations with other universities, with other education institutions, with industry, with government and with society. Uh, for me, it does not make sense anymore to think about a university that is closed in itself. And then that will translate in a more operational way to uh, do, for example, to offer shorter courses on demanding skills, like micro-credentials, for example, things that will, what the currently all universities offer is just way too long. We cannot start just a degree that, and then in four years uh, to, to even pretend that that's gonna have any relevance for, for the labor market. So um, shorter courses will help. Also more flexible pathways, I mean, these days, and this is different by country, but uh, students need to get in and follow a very specific path until they finish. If universities become more flexible to let students to go in and out, to let students to mix different disciplines or different uh, courses from different faculties or even from different universities or even to take licenses that are from other education institutions, that would already help. Uh, there's no doubt, um, as Jason was talking about, um, uh, the risk of automation. The only way that you can counterbalance that is with human skills, and that's transversal skills. And I am a university lecturer myself, and believe me, I have very, very little um, training about how to teach. 
and us having knowledge and considered to be experts about a specific topic doesn't make us good lecturers, doesn't make us know how to just introduce transversal skills into our teaching because it's not just about giving a course about teamwork it's being able to teach biology and teach transversal skills and teach physics and do transversal skills within it is not easy and no one or, or very few lecturers have solid like training about how to do that mm. Jason, uh, you you know, can I pick up just off of what Victoria said there? Because that's, uh, that's uh, a, a, an issue that I could not agree more with. And I, and I want to just drive that home. We require in, in uh, most European countries and Canada and the US, we require a three to four year university degree to teach kindergarten. And we don't require any educational uh, training for, uh, in order to become a university professor. And I speak as one. I understand that like, like, the first time I walked in to teach a university course, all I did was I said, oh, well, that's how the guys that I watched when I was in university did it. So I'm just going to do what they did. Um, and then you go and you talk to someone who's got a degree in education to teach kindergarten or K to 12 and the concept of educational pedagogy and how you do skills development and how you do trans uh, disciplinary. Th I, it is a different world. And I think this gets to, to two issues that, uh, that I think are really worth putting on the table. Um, uh, Victoria, I, I just want to say I agree that uh, it's not the death knell for the modern university. There's absolutely a role for the modern university in, 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 in the future. And I think a lot of the ideas that you laid out there are absolutely brilliant. But one of the things I'm noticing along the ideas that you laid out there, the sort of micro-credentialing, the opportunity to do more creative stuff, the high-end universities, the, the uh, Harvards, Oxfords, UCLs, uh, MITs, uh, et cetera, they'll do really well in that. And they can offer those micro-credits virtually everywhere in the world it's the next few layers down of universities that really are facing that creative destruction. And in part, it's because even in those institutions, faculty are incentivized and promoted based on research, not based on how, way, how well they're evolving the education system. And that's the primary thing in my mind that is just misaligned with the direction of travel. Everyone is motivated to get that next research paper. No one's motivated to get that next innovative course out there. And those that truly are, are not promoted as effectively there. And yes, some universities are trying to, to push forward and say, no, no, we are going to, uh, to create equal promotion tracks for, for those as, and we'll call them teaching professors. And of course, that's another way of saying, we're going to call them the other type of second class citizen because lecturer is not a good enough title. And the, the tension between being higher research institutions and higher education institutions, it's never going to be a problem for the Ivy Leagues. It's that next layer down that are really going to face the challenge. And we're gonna see social enterprises. We're going to see educational startups. We're going to see New, uh, I visited uh, Delhi in 2019, before COVID, obviously, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and in, in, new, in Delhi alone, in India, I visited 10 universities that were less than 10 years old. And they're all innovating around education. They're not innovating around research. So there are places in the world that are really driving on the future of education, but it, that's where what that, that incentive structure in the modern university is one of the biggest tensions that we have. And I couldn't agree more, Victoria, we have to rethink that. Yeah, and I think to, to add something there, I mean, Jason, you touched upon that uh, earlier. And I think that, I don't know if it is a divide or if it's, if it's only seen as such. because on the one hand, I, I perceive that universities are fought more and more as a, as a tool to, pro, you know, to produce the right labor which you know, says, okay, you need to revolutionize very, very quickly. But on the other hand, there's, uh, you know, we talked about virtues. I mean, we talked about you know, critical thinking, we talk, talked about you know, epistemology, ontology, et cetera. Is, is, is there a tension between those that, that you know, the role of universities are, are, are you know, split in the middle between you know, being a, a ivory tower far, far from society that holds on to, to their principles or, uh, in the other hand, kind of the market pool saying, you know, produce the best um, MP MBAs and MPPs and, and, and engineering degrees for what the students will actually get hired on. I think, uh, so a couple of thoughts on that that I would add. Uh, I 
I have a difficulty with thinking about the, the concept of the academic virtues as separated from the real world. Uh, when you look back in history at the most creative geniuses, the most creative uh, academics that did their research, they were living through times when the real world around them was giving them the stimulus in order to do that. And uh, it's uh, uh, the idea that we have to teach the concepts of critical thinking uh, or, or, or research and the basic uh, foundations of the scientific principles and the scientific method as detached from the real world is bluntly due to the lack of creativity of the educators. Um, it is very possible to teach all of those virtues and values in, in the process of engaging the participants in problem-based learning, in engagement with real-world problems, where they're also developing the technical skills, where they're also developing the vocational skills. So I don't see them as being antithetical. I, I see it as being a challenge with how we've done the educational design. And the other thing I'll say is, um, not to put too fine a point on it, but we don't need everyone in society to be a university professor. We certainly still need plumbers and electricians and technicians and people with good technical skills in order to, and we can add some of the university, uh, the, the ideas that we hold in the ivory tower to those types of educations uh, just as much as we can bring some of that technical skill into some of the uh, educational programs that we, that we hold within universities as separate from that. So I, I think it's a mix. Yeah, th thank, you for, thank you for that. I'm going to let Victoria have the uh, option to comment as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to put a, one last question before we round this up, which you can think about it. Meanwhile, Jason, when I pass the, pass the word to, to Victoria, but it's also uh, what I will learn from the pandemic. Has the pandemic, um, you know, strengthened the trend of, of everything going online or has it proven to be the best argument for actually this is the time for, for in-person uh, and, you know, MOOCs, the MOOCs hype has, has come and gone? Um, big question. Uh, we don't have too much time, but I'll, I'm going to throw it out there as well. Victoria. I'll try to go through quickly, uh, through them quickly. Just going back to, to the prior question, uh, when uh, Jason was talking about the misalignment of incentives, that's something I did study business. And from an organizational point of view, it just doesn't make sense. So you, you hire someone because he's a good researcher, but then you put them only KPIs that are research related, but then, oh, by the way, there is also teaching, but there is no KPIs with that at all. So that, it just, does not make sense. But um, I also have to bring governments here because there are countries in which public universities are the majority of it. And so these incentives usually come from public policy. So if already governments are saying that the way we're going to evaluate all the academics in the country is going to be based on research, it's not that universities themselves can have much more of a say on that. They can encourage them to be good educators, but at the end of the day, the real incentives are set by the government are our own research. So that is in respect to, to the other question. And when you talk about um, the academic uh, virtues or, or the lay, or universities are as labor market tool, I do totally agree with, with Jason in the sense that they are not contradictory. And it's very common. I found myself in conversations lately in which uh, when we ask about the alignment of uh, HEIs to, to business needs or labor market needs, there are some people who disagree and they say, that, oh, that's company training. And it's like, hold on. In, in a rapidly evolving world, and if we take the last large um, surveys that have been done uh, to employers about what are the skills more demanded, and sometimes they even mix transversal and technical skills, they all agree transversal skills. Technical skills are going to be totally outdated in two years. You don't want that. Or, or at least if you have to priori prioritize, you don't prioritize that. You want graduates that are able to adapt to the constant and rapidly changes of the labor market. And you're only going to uh, have that with the transversal skills. And also those skills will make graduates better citizens. And we're talking about critical thinking, cultural awareness, resilience, like proactivity. Those are better citizens uh, at the end of the day. And, uh, and we shouldn't be scared about, are we thinking too much about universities as a, as a tool for labor market. If we don't do so, we're also putting a huge burden in graduates because they will not find a job. 
and a large proportion of the population being unemployed also put a burden in a society. So let's just, and traditionally we have not think of universities in the, in the value change of companies at all. So I, th I think we need to push a little bit, just being completely aware that there are those uh, skills that might not be directly applicable. There is this theory, there is these basics. Yes, they need to remain, but we just need to balance it a bit more. And in order to balance, I feel we need to push a bit on this side. A short sentence in the COVID um, changes. Uh, COVID change, the changes that COVID has brought, a lot of them will remain. And I, I definitely don't have a definite answer about what's going to happen. But I've been thinking lately, for example, the possibilities of if online learning really stays, does it mean that me, like a person like me that want to uh, continue just having an education or an 18 year old person from anywhere in the world, could they all apply to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, because they are going to be studying from home? Is then anyone competing with anyone in, you know, in, the, in the student, in the, in the education sector? Uh, that really makes me think because these universities have started to really broaden up. Before they were elite because they only accepted a very small percentage of the people that apply. But if they continue broadening up the amount of people that they can actually accept because they are studying online, what about universities beyond those top universities? Will, if I can choose to study in any university of the world and I am more likely to do it in those top, I'll give it a go. Yeah. So it really poses uh, a lot of uh, very interesting questions and I just don't want to stand myself and just uh, let Jason just to say something about this as well. Perfect, Victoria, thank you. I, I, I agree with everything you've said. I'll just add a couple of thoughts that have been in the back of my head about what, uh, what COVID has been, uh, how it's been accelerating some trends. So Oscar, you asked about, you know, is COVID accelerating? And, and the short answer is absolutely. I think it is gonna accelerate the creative destruction issues um, because uh, it, it has, as Victoria said, has opened up uh, uh, the market even more than it used to. And if more students are competing to go to Stanford or Harvard or uh, uh, because edX and other platforms like that make it more accessible, it's going to make it that much harder for the, uh, the second, third tier, as we call them, tier universities to compete unless they truly diversify. So I think we're seeing, that's one driver that we're certainly seeing. A second driver that we're seeing though is, frankly, COVID has locked a lot of researchers out of their labs and locked a lot of uh, the, those professors who've never really had to think much about teaching, who just use the same slide deck from year to year to year to teach a course to think about, damn, how am I gonna do this online? And maybe I, I, I have seen it spur a reasonable amount of creativity and, and educational thought. Um, uh, of course, uh, I think that that's leading to the question of, uh, uh, Oscar, you asked the question, is it gonna continue to go online or is it going to uh, uh, have a pull back to doing in-person when COVID is over? And I think the answer is both. There's a lot, we, we need social interaction. Uh, going to college, is not just an education that happens in the classroom. You learn how to be an adult in modern society um, uh, uh, when you go to college in terms of the interactions you have, all the social clubs. Uh, uh, most of the alumni that we speak to when we're looking at how, uh, uh, how to think about our programs today, when you ask them 10 years on, what did you learn from college? What do you remember from college? Very little of it has to do with what they did in the classroom. Very little of it has to do with what they did in the classroom. Um, it's mostly the experiential learning that they did at that point in time. Um, and the courses they do remember are almost always the experiential ones. So you mentioned MOOCs, Oscar. It, MOOCs in the concept of we just broadcast the same information to 10,000 people rather than 100 people uh, and then do a few quizzes to see if they got it. Yeah okay, interesting, and I'll do that the next time I know I need to learn to code Python, the, the next time I know I need to learn to do the next technical skill, but I'm probably gonna wait until the point in time that I need that technical skill, because otherwise it's gonna be outdated in a year anyway. But the real advances in, uh, in the online education is where the experiment is with experiential learning. How do you create interesting conversations and interactions and that has to, whether it's in the physical classroom or the virtual classroom, problem-based experiential learning 
I would argue is the way you get that tra those transverse skills. You also pick up a lot of technical skills along the way, but that really has to be the future. And that is not um, a, a, a middle-aged or aging white man like me standing in front of the room and lecturing at you. That's a pretty boring way to, uh, to learn most of this stuff. You have to have it by interacting with your peers, with people who have experience in the real world. And so if we think about ourselves as educators, more as curators of that experiential learning rather than the providers of knowledge, I mean, the very fact that the titles, lecturer and professor, what do they do? They lecture and they profess. Maybe we even need to rethink what we call our educators because it really does change the way we think about the model of the education we're delivering. And I do think COVID is spurring that because all of those experiential things that they've been experimenting with in person, translating that virtually, that's the conversation I'm having day in, day out with universities in Europe and North America right now talking about how to change the world because that's what we're trying to do and that's what universities, that's what educators are grappling with. Well, thank you very much for that, Jason. There's, uh, there's a lot more to be said, and this might be the end of this discussion, but it's not the end of the discussion, and we will get back to this um, a lot more. Uh, you can follow what we're doing at cdc.ie.edu. Uh, you can watch our other conversations of the future, and you can follow the research result of this research project on the future of higher education uh, coming early next year. So thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much, Victoria, and we're looking forward to continue this. Bye. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Victoria. It was a real pleasure. <laughs>